All right, so today or tonight or whatever time you're watching this is we're going to talk for a moment about qualitative analysis. Um, so far we've been talking a lot about quantitative stuff and, you know, really looking at the numbers. But now we're going to look at a solution where basically our goal is to try to determine the types of ions that are located in the solution. Um, are present in the solution. Boy, I can't write. Types of ions present, there we go, um, in solution. So in order to kind of explain this, I want you to imagine that if we have a beaker, a mixture of stuff, now I'm going to put an enormous number of things in this mixture. We would never have this many things mixed together, but um, perhaps it's got some uh, mercury ions, silver ions, there's mercury 1 and mercury 2, cadmium, bismuth, copper, uh, tin, cobalt, you can, we can just keep going. I'm making just an enormous list of things. Now please understand, we would be talking about a much smaller mixture, but I'm going to use this very generically um, as we go through this. These are really like all the different possibilities that it could include. All right, I'm almost done. There we go. Sodium and potassium. And if we wanted to start to analyze, if this was a mixture, for example, and we didn't know what was in it, and, and maybe these are some of the possibilities, we can use the idea of our solubility rules to help us to actually figure out what might be in it. So that being said, if I was trying to determine what was in that, there might be some steps I would go through. And so the first thing I might do to this solution if I was trying to identify what's in it is I might add hydrochloric acid. And if I do, you know, the question is, well, if I, I do that, what will come out of solution? What will precipitate out of solution? And if you think about it, it's really going to be those things that are the insoluble chlorides. So what would come out? Well, silver chloride would. And mercury chloride and, and lead chloride. Those are our insoluble chlorides. Those are the only ones that would precipitate with, with the chlorine. So if, if we put HCl in it and something precipitated out, we would know that it was one of those three ions. And maybe we knew something about our original mixture. Maybe we knew there was lead in it and we needed to prove it. We would add HCl and that would happen. Okay, so now those basically get removed. So if we go back up to our, our chart here, you know, our silver will get removed, our, our mercury one um, will get removed, and our lead, wherever my lead is, did I not write lead in there? Maybe I didn't. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and just write it and cross it out. And if it's in there and I'm missing it, you can cross it out there too. All right, another thing that we could do then, once that's precipitated out, another thing we could do is add a solution of H2S. Now, there's already hydrochloric acid in there, so I want us to think about this equilibrium for a moment. So if in our solution of H2S, we have a, a large concentration of hydrogen ions, which we do because we added HCl. That means that equilibrium is going to shift to the left, and so there's only going to be a very, very small amount of S minus, sorry, S2 minus um, in there. So what's going to precipitate out when that happens is that's going to cause the really insoluble sulfides to precipitate out, those that have really, really small uh, KSP values. And so those are going to be ones like HGS, cadmium sulfide, bismuth sulfide, copper 2 sulfide, and tin sulfide. Those are the ones that will precipitate out when you've added HCl first and then H2S after, okay? So if I go back 
back up here to my original. We've got our mercury 2, our cadmium, our bismuth, um, our copper, and our tin would precipitate out on this next step. Again, we're not doing numbers here. Qualitative analysis is really our way of identifying what's in there. Um, now, within this group, would we know which is which? No, not without further testing. And we're not going to deal with the further testing here. But we could at least identify that, hey, it, it's got mercury or cadmium or bismuth or, or copper two or tin. And again, you guys, we would never have that many things in solution. So we might know, oh, it's just a mixture of lead and tin and cobalt. And let's, you know, it could be a mixture of lead and tin and cobalt. Let's do these tests to see if something precipitates out. All right, from there. We might go ahead and add, on top of all of that stuff, some hydroxide. Well, if you think again back to this, because that's already in solution, the hydroxide, of course, is going to start removing the hydrogen ion concentration, which is going to cause it to shift to the right. And so now the concentration of S2 minus is going to get higher. So now our, that's going to cause two things to precipitate out. It's going to cause our insoluble hydroxides to precipitate out because we've added hydroxides. And those are going to be like aluminum hydroxide and chromium hydroxide. But it's also going to allow the, the more soluble sulfides to precipitate out because the concentration of sulfide ion is going to be higher. And so that's going to include things like the cobalt sulfide, zinc, mag manganese, nickel, and iron. Those will now precipitate out because the concentration of sulfide will be high enough to cause a precipitate to occur. So if you think about the Q, it'll be high enough. So now back to our list. That means we're precipitating out cobalt, zinc, manganese, nickel, iron, um, our aluminum, and our chromium are precipitating out here. All right, another thing we could do to allow stuff to precipitate out is to add something with carbonate in it. And what that's going to cause to precipitate out are the insoluble carbonates. And again, this goes all back to our solubility chart. Well, of the group that's left, calcium, barium, strontium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, three of those are insoluble. And that's the barium carbonate, the calcium carbonate, and the strontium carbonate. And so these will precipitate out when you add carbonate ions. So scrolling back up here, calcium, barium, strontium is going to be left. And so now if you think about what's left in our beaker, well, it's just going to be the sodium and the potassium and the lithium. And there's no flame, there's, I'm sorry, there's no solubility rules here. I mean, these guys are always soluble. And in addition to those, I could add to this list, I could add ammonium, because that would also be true. That one would never have precipitated out at this point. And in that being said, with this group, if I wanted to try to identify them, I could do flame tests. Because sodium ions will give a yellow flame if I put that solution in there and I see a yellow flame. If it was potassium, um, I would get a violet flame, lithium, a red flame. And, and if there were other alkaline metals in there, I could identify them based on their flame test as well. So what I want you to see, really, this is in many cases a, 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 another type of selective precipitation. I'm not doing it numerically, but by adding things in a very prescribed order, I can cause some things to precipitate out, leaving others behind. And that will allow me to identify or to confirm the existence of those things in solution. Um, and if I really had a solution that, that was that mixed up, I would need to do further tests within each group. For example, within this group, I would need further tests to confirm 
you know, which ones were actually in there. But we're just looking at the general idea of qualitative analysis. Um, and we will be doing a lab after the AP test where you get to identify um, ions present in solutions by way of, you know, reacting them and, and forming solids. So you'll get a chance to play with that after the AP test. All right, have a great weekend.